All right, well, hello, everyone. Welcome back. We've got a pretty cool guest today. We've got Jonathan Autopole, who is with us. Now, Jonathan, do you want to share just a little bit about kind of your background and what you've specialized in as we get into the stream here? Uh, sure. Um... Yeah, my uh, PhD is from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. And most of my work has been on deported peoples, uh, particularly the ethnic Germans from the Volga and Black Sea regions, although there's smaller populations or were, they, they were all deported eastward uh, in the Caucasus. Uh, Crimea and uh, other parts of European uh, Russia before the uh, 1941 uh, forced removals uh, eastward into Kazakhstan and uh, Siberia. Uh, so I guess uh, technically uh, my degree would be in Oriental history uh, specializing in uh, the Soviet Orient, but uh, the largest group of people in terms of population that I've written on uh, are not Oriental. They are the uh, ethnic Germans descended from uh, colonists and settlers that started arriving in 1764 in response to the two manifestos by Emperor Catherine II. Interesting. Yeah, I there were a couple of reasons why I thought, you know, I really want to get I really want to get Otto on the stream because, you know, he's got this very unique um, treasure trove of knowledge to this stuff, to to an era of, of history and ethnography that is very poorly known in the West. I only have very, very, very little knowledge of it myself. So being able to get Otto on here and dive into it a bit, I think the the sort of history of the German diaspora, both in the East and West, but especially in the East is kind of one of the great untold stories of, of the last couple centuries. So getting able to just kind of dive into it a bit is something that I was very interested in. Uh, do you want to share a little bit about kind of what, what got you into this kind of your, your background growing up? Um, uh, well, I mean, my my family are ethnic Germans uh, from Poland and Volhynia, which is the northwestern part of Ukraine. Uh, so my grandfather's native language was German, and my great grandfather uh, uh, came to the U.S. from Canada after being denied entry in the U.S. after uh, avoiding mobilization in the reserves for the Russian army to fight against Japan in 1905. Uh, but growing up, I think I became interested in uh, non-Russians living in the Soviet Union because my neighbors were uh, Lithuanian activists. Uh, the, the old uh, grandma had actually uh, been a concert pianist, in uh, classical pianist in Lithuania during uh, the first uh, modern independence uh, from 1918 to 19. Uh, 41. And then when the Soviets came back in uh, 1944, 1945, uh, she uh, managed to uh, hitch a ride with the Germans westward by digging tank ditches. So she was a rather tough old lady. Uh, but uh, they had some fascinating stories about uh, guerrillas uh, in the forest fighting against the NKVD in the late 40s and early 50s. And uh, dissident movements uh, later. So uh, when I got to uh, university uh, and then after I kind of uh, looked into this uh, Soviet nationality policy, in particular, I was uh, fascinated by the uh, Soviet government's ability to move entire nations uh, by cattle car eastward. Uh, and of course, the largest group uh, with about half of them, over a million people, with the, the ethnic Germans, which is my own uh, heritage. And it was a, somewhat easier to study the knowledge because a lot more material. But 
unlike the other groups, uh, I had the German and Russian languages, whereas uh, I can only study uh, most of the uh, Turkic peoples and uh, Kalmyks and others uh, using a Russian. Uh, I don't, uh, my, my, my ability to read any of the Turkish languages is, is very, very limited. Uh, uh, the one I have best is uh, Kyrgyz because I have a, a family connections uh, there through my wife, but uh, uh, it's just, uh, it was easier to do everything in Indo-European languages. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense, definitely. Yeah, because, and you've, you know, taught all around the world, it sounds like, from your, from your background, so. I've taught at three universities, uh, American University of Central Asia in Kyrgyzstan, uh, University of Ghana, obviously in Ghana, and uh, American University of Iraq, Sulaimania in the Kurdish region of Iraq. Did When you were teaching at those universities, did it feel like you had um, less overall restrictions about, say, you know, I don't know, the, the nature of, of how you can teach or, or getting into controversial areas of, of uh well, I never I mean, taught in the U.S. on the university level, so I don't have. I, a, I imagine the U.S. is just kind of its own, <laughs> its, its own sack of potatoes. You know, quite quite a difficult place to to teach much of anything these days. Um, yeah, I think I think uh, for the most part, yeah, outside the U.S. there's a lot more academic freedom. Even when we talk about places that are condemned for authoritarianism. When I go to an academic conference or have been to academic conferences in places like Ankara or Moscow, it always seems a lot more uh, intellectually free in the, the conference itself than those I've been to in places like uh, New York City or uh, uh, the West Coast of the U.S. Yeah, uh, that makes sense. Um, do you want to give a little bit of an a kind of basic overview for those in the audience who really haven't heard of Russian German history and to them this is sort of like a new a new thing what's what's kind of a teaser what what's something to just kind of intro people about well uh, I mean it it's one of the sub-ethnic groups if you want to refer to them that uh, way that we know exactly when it was formed. So uh, Catherine II, who herself was German, uh, became the uh, Tsarina and Empress of the Russian Empire, uh, basically by killing her husband, uh, Peter III. Uh, and she wanted to, uh, she didn't have enough people. I mean, Russia had a lot of land area and not enough people. So she wanted to bring in colonists uh, from Europe uh, to settle for farming for a number of reasons. A primary reason was uh, to put these people as a human wall between uh, Moscow, uh, which was no longer the capital at this time, St. Petersburg further away had uh, become the new capital, but still an important city. Uh, and various Asian nomadic uh, nomads, most notably the Kazakhs, uh, who uh, early on destroyed uh, three of the uh, Volga German uh, villages that are established uh, in the late 18th century. So the Kazakhs and also the Kalmyks and the Bashkirs uh, in that region were a problem. Uh, but also just to have people uh, cultivating a land uh, and also to have uh, Europeans do it to kind of provide an example, a, a model for the Russians uh, and other Slavs, most notably uh, uh, after 1804, uh, Ukrainians, when uh, there's a, a manifesto by Catherine II's uh, grandson, Alexander I, to settle the Black Sea region. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's and one question I had regarding that is, and this this is a super basic question, uh, so forgive me for that. But is there a really any difference between the term Volga German and Russian German? Yes, Are these referring to the same. No, uh, they're both geographical terms. 
So Russland Deutsche, or uh, in, in German, uh, Russland is the territory of the Russian Empire. So in Russian, it's uh, Rosiski Nemsi. And so they have the term Rosia, which is the ge geographical territory of Russia, rather than Ruski, which is the ethnic Russian. Uh, and so then Volga Deutsche, or uh, Nemsi Pavolja, just the area on the Volga River around uh, mm. Saratov and Samara, uh, well, yeah, Samara as well, uh, but particularly Saratov, uh, the city on the Volga, and you have uh, the development of um, Angles and uh, Katarina Stadt, which later becomes Markstadt as a kind of urban area, the capital of the Volga German ASSR is uh, becomes Angles, and the city uh, still exists under that name in uh, the Russian Federation, even though uh, there has not been any uh, autonomous German territory uh, in that region since 1941. Okay, yeah, no, that that helps me understand it a, a bit better. Um, is so? Is it correct then that there are essentially two? waves of key German migration, first beginning with Catherine II's invitation, and then second with the forced deportation in the Second World, or at the end of the Second World War, is that correct? Uh, there are a lot more. So the, the first first wave comes in to the uh, Russian Empire from 1764 uh onward uh, in the late 18th century, about 25,000 or so, mostly Germans, but not all, because the original manifesto in 1762, which isn't very effective, it's really the one in 1763 uh, uh, in July that, that brings people in, it stated that all Christian foreigners could settle in the Russian Empire. Mm. Uh, so... Uh, and, and technically, uh, there are some Jews that settle under this, even though they're not supposed to. So it, it's uh, uh, not just Germans. There are people that come from France, uh, particularly German speakers from Alsace. Uh, there are some from Sweden. There are some from uh, 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 other parts of, of Europe uh, that settle. Uh, but a lot of the Western and Central uh, Northern Europeans, say from the Mennonites uh, from the Netherlands, mm. become Germanized, uh, particularly linguistically, uh, as they uh, go east. Uh, but the bulk of the people come from the states that become unified uh, as the Second Reich in uh, 1871. So. A lot of the initial Volga Germans come from Hesse because of the reaction against the Seven Year War. And you see a lot uh, coming from Baden Württemberg, uh, particularly uh, after the Napoleonic Wars uh, in coming into the Black Sea region. So there's the first wave of the Volga uh, in the 18th century under Catherine II. There's a uh, uh, a small wave, particularly Mennonites, coming in from uh, Prussia uh, under her son, Paul I, about 1800, and then her grandson, Alexander I, in 1804, uh, but particularly after 1815, a huge wave coming into uh, the Black Sea region in Ukraine and Crimea. Uh, and then the last big wave, uh, because they were no longer really accepting uh, colonists from outside the Russian Empire were Germans that were in Congress Poland, taken in 1815, going to Volhynia. So uh, after the 1863 Polish uprising, a lot of that land is confiscated by the Tsarist government and then leased out uh, to ethnic Germans living in Congress Poland, uh, including my great-great-grandfather Ferdinand, who rented a least a Kutor in uh, Kortal, which was an early German settlement, but like everybody else going from Poland to Volhynia, about 171,000 Germans uh, 
my great great grandfather got there late, but that's where my great grandfather was born. So, uh, so that's the wave coming in. But starting in 1874, uh, when they removed the immunity from conscription, you start to see a waves out. You see about 300,000, about a quarter of the population emigrate to the United States from the Volga region, mm. particularly Kansas, Nebraska, and Colorado. Uh, and from the Black Sea region, particularly North Dakota and South Dakota. A number of them uh, spilled over into your state of Minnesota, I believe. I, I hadn't realized that so many of the Germans here in America were originally from the Volga region. I mean, it makes sense in the case of, say, the Mennonites. Uh, but yeah, I, I hadn't known that about, uh, about our And then here. there was uh, also a big wave into Argentina. It may have the largest uh, Russian German, particularly Volga German population uh, outside of Germany now. Hmm. So, and were these 19th century? Yes, Germany? yes, yes. This is the 19th century. So late 19th century, early 20th century. Uh, a lot of them, because of removal of the freedom from conscription in 1874, even more so, uh, the mobilization in the reserves to fight against Japan in 1904, 1905. Uh, and a lot of the, in the Black Sea region, they, they had just, they, they couldn't get any more land. Their population kept growing, but their ability to get more land became limited. So they either migrated eastward into Central Asia uh, or westward into Canada, the U.S., Argentina, and Brazil. So uh, we, we, there's four Russian German languages, believe it or not, uh, English, Spanish, and Portuguese <laughs> being a, a five, I guess, but German, Russian, English, Spanish, Portuguese, five, five languages. Interesting. Oh, funny. Yeah. That's, that's quite the variety there. Um, wow. So, and then kind of take us through to the, to the start of the 20th century. I mean, so there's this kind of streaming back again and out to to the new world um and then what what was kind of the the day-to-day -day situation for a lot of these volga germans what was life like um in the in the 19th leading into the 20th century well it uh, was pretty good economically uh with some exceptions so there's a huge famine uh at the end of the 19th century, uh, and that causes a number of them also to leave, uh, particularly uh, into Kazakhstan and areas further east. Uh, they, they start to come to Siberia in large numbers uh, in 1907, uh, and uh, that migration continues up until World War One in 1914. Uh, so uh, it's a mixed bag, but. Uh, uh, most of the Russian Germans opted to stay, about three quarters of them, rather than emigrate to the Western Hemisphere, despite the fact that there was a famine in the Volga and there was uh, severe land shortages in the Black Sea region, and there was a revocation of the privileges granted by the Manifesto in 1763, uh, most notably, uh, freedom from military conscription. Uh, and this, of course, is very different than what happens in the 20th and 21st century, where uh, the majority of ethnic uh, Germans in the former Soviet Union opt to leave. Hmm. Okay. And for the Volga Germans, how much of their prior German culture and language and connections, how much of that remained? Was that kind of a case-by-case -case basis depending no, on... No, no, it remained solid all the way up until the 1941 deportation. So, okay. and, and, and so I guess we should get into the early Soviet period, but sure, yeah. there's this uh, thing that are getting worse uh, in the late 19th century after 1874 and the beginning of the 20th century, but they get really bad in World War One, so during uh, the First World War, 
1915, you have a pogrom against the Russian Germans in Moscow, where they target their businesses, and there are three killed. You have uh, the liquidation laws, which prohibit them from owning land or leasing land 150 kilometers from the western border of the Russian Empire. And so those people are forced to uh, give up their property and then are forcibly relocated either into the Volga or Siberia, a uh, couple hundred thousand, uh, mostly from Volhynia, but also uh, Poland, Lithuania, uh, Bessarabia, so that, that whole Western strip on the border with uh, Austria and Germany. Uh, and then the uh, plan to deport all of the ethnic Germans into Siberia, including all those in the Volga, uh, were supposed to be carried out on March 1917, but in February 1917, the Tsarist government is overthrown and the new provisional government uh, suspends those plans and they are not uh, realized until uh, 1941 under the very different government of Joseph Stalin in the Soviet Union. So are, are you saying these plans had been in the works even under the days of Tsar Nicholas II? There was planned to deport them in World War I, but the Tsarist government was open. They had done partial deportations from yeah. the Western regions already. And, okay, okay. So, and what was kind of the rationale at, at the time? That the German colonists would be a Trojan horse supporting the government in Berlin, which they were yeah. at war at. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, I was going to ask about the Danube Swabians in Hungary. Do you, like, weren't they expelled after yes. World War II? Uh, uh, most of them. Um, a lot of the ones uh, in what uh, was, well, what, it, what, it, what becomes Romania after World War I uh, were there until the end of communism. So, uh, about half of the Germans in uh, Hungary are expelled uh, mostly by the Soviet Red Army uh, at the end of, of World War II in 44 and 45, so about 200,000. And then the, the uh, ethnic Germans in Yugoslavia, uh, 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 most of them uh, are put in uh, concentration camps and about 50,000 die uh, and then they are uh, forced to emigrate uh, out to Austria and Germany in the uh, late 1940s, early 1950s. So there's very few ethnic Germans left in Yugoslavia uh, after that time. Uh, they're still today uh, said uh, some Germans in Hungary descended of the about 200,000 that were not expelled. And then in Romania, uh, there was a fairly large German population uh, all the way up until uh, the fall of communism, and then they all emigrated to, to Germany. But uh, a lot of them had, about 75,000 were sent to do forced labor in the USSR at the end of the Second World War uh, as a way of uh, reparation through labor is what the Soviet government called it. Uh, but it, it believed that there was a agreement between the Romanian government when it switched sides from the Axis to the Allies, uh, that if it uh, allowed its German population to be used as a slave labor force in the USSR, that uh, the Soviets wouldn't uh, impose the same type of labor reparations against ethnic Romanians. Hmm. Yeah. Do, uh, go ahead, Fjolnir. Yeah, just the, the, they've been there for so long, ever since the 17th century, in the, in the same area, basically. Yeah, well, I mean, there's just two. The, 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 in the Banat, they, they came in the early 18th century. I think the first settlements are 1711. But, of course, going back to the uh, 13th century are the uh, Germans in Transylvania, the Siebenbergen. Uh, so the... That was probably the first, uh, you know, big uh, settlement of Germans outside of Central Europe uh, was uh, 
but then the Teutonic Knights were, were there afterwards, uh, briefly, uh, the invitation of the Hungarian kings to uh, protect the region from the Kumans. But even after the Teutonic Knights were expelled from Transylvania to end up in uh, uh, what becomes uh, Prussia, uh, the Siebenbergen population was there. I mean, there's still a few there. I think there's like 35,000 ethnic Germans left in Romania. But at one time, uh, there were close to 800,000. So the population obviously has uh, massively declined through uh, emigration, the return of uh, Aussiedler and Spate Aussiedler to Germany. It's interesting. The other thing I want, uh, sorry, the one other thing I want folks to know is that uh, we've got Otto's YouTube channel linked down below. So do, do yourself a huge favor, go check out his channel down below. Um, you, you'll definitely, you'll find way more in-depth content covering this era of history. So yeah, please go ahead and check that out. Anyway, back to you, Fjolnir. Yeah, I was going to say, it's interesting that the, you know, the, the, the rationale behind expulsion, expulsion of an entire ethnic group that has been living in the area for hundreds of years seems to only apply to the Germans, like especially in the 20th century. There were some others. Uh, the Hungarians were expelled from Slovakia uh, at the same time as the Germans were expelled from the Sudetenland uh, as part of the kind of same uh, program under Benez, the Benez decrees. Uh, and Hungary, of course, had been an access power to the end and did not switch sides like the Romanians. So uh, there was no protection from Hungarians also joining the some 30,000 ethnic Germans from Hungary that were sent to do forced labor. So a, particularly a lot of Hungarian prisoners of war sent to the Soviet Union uh, to do forced labor in group V camps. Just comes down to the question, you know, what makes an ethnic group, what makes it enable him to make, make a claim on a land to begin with? It's like an interesting question, mm. you know, so like morally and historically and so forth. If, if you can well, be expelled after centuries <laughs> of inhabitation, you know. <laughs> yes, well, I mean, uh, I suppose, you know, when it comes down to it, uh, it's all about, a, a, how you can uh, enforce it through power. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But as far as, you know, kind of making a, a, a legal argument as to why they have uh, the right, uh, the Germans, particularly those in the, in the Volga, uh, always pointed to the manifesto of 22nd July, 1763 by Catherine the second. And then uh, there is the formation of the Volga German autonomous Workers' Commune uh, by Lenin himself, the first uh, ethno-state established in the Soviet Union uh, way back in 19th of October, 1918. Uh, and so uh, it gets upgraded to the Volga German ASSR. But if you look at the Soviet constitution, uh, which was written mostly by Bukharin in 36, uh, the way in which the deportation was carried out and the liquidation of the Volga German ASSR were completely uh, against both the 36th Soviet Constitution as well as the 37 RSFSR and 37 Volga German ASSR Constitution. So, uh, they, uh, it, I mean, it doesn't mean much when the totalitarian state who changes things all the time, but uh, uh, even under their own legal system, which they had total control over, they, they still ended up violating it. I also wanted to ask how isolated were these communities in, in Russia? Like, did they intermarry? At no, all? they would generally, each village would be established around a particular church. So about 70 to 75 percent were Lutheran. So the village would have a Lutheran church and people in the village would be Lutherans. Uh, they would not uh, associate with uh, the villages uh, that were Catholic, about 20%, or Mennonite, about 5%. And, and even in when they came to the United States, uh, up until the 1970s, it was considered scandalous. If, for instance, uh, 
somebody of uh, Lutheran Volga German descent decided to marry somebody of Catholic Black Sea German descent. Uh, I, I knew a couple. Of the the they're so old. The the man died a couple of years ago, but they they're famous. Uh, uh, for the study of, of German literature and language uh, in, uh, they, I believe they were at the University of Texas. But uh, uh, it, when they got married in the 1950s, it was considered a big deal because he was from a, 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 they a Volga German Lutheran family and she was from a Black Sea Catholic family. So this was a, almost like an interracial marriage. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well, even in the even in the nineties, my to share a little bit personally, my grandfather, who was a, a World War II vet, um, an, an old Norwegian man, uh, despite you know his side of the family being here for since just before the start of the twentieth century, uh, he was still very much opposed to the idea of his Norwegian daughter marrying a Swede. This was uh, this was quite controversial. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, the uh, there's been a lot of homogenization. Uh, and so it, it takes a while even for, as I said, the Russian German to, you know, become a coherent group uh, identity wise, yet alone to kind of uh, start intermixing with other Germans from from Germany proper. Uh, what becomes the Second Reich in 1871, and then other European Americans. So uh, it's probably really only in the starting in the late 60s, early 70s, we start to see you know uh, the groups start to intermarry with other European Americans. And is this a case too of because I I think one of the strange phenomenon that you find kind of with a lot of diasporas is that they have this preservation effect at times wherein they can, you know, a group from a group travels to another land in, let's say the, the 1700s and then carries on these sort of older. And when they think back at their homeland, they think back at their old culture, they're thinking back to these memories from the time of their immigration rather than from, they didn't go through always the same, modernization process in one area in one country as in another oh yeah that's definitely true i mean even look at the the dialects spoken so basically uh the volga german dialect which i don't speak i only speak hochdeutsch but uh, is basically late 18th century german but all of the words for anything that is the technological development after that period of time is a russian loan word so instead of uh oh. Der Wagen for car, it's machina, the Russian word. Instead of uh, uh, Kuhlschrank for refrigerator, it's Holodnik. So all of the modern uh, technologies, uh, vocabulary was Russian. That, that's really, you know, that's not good. You know, I, I hate loan words because uh, interesting case for, I, I thought in you know, German was like a language you can, it functions very similar to Icelandic. You can put together two words, right? Cre right. Cre create a new word. So, well, uh, no, I mean, but they weren't aware of what these new words were, so they yeah, yeah, adopted you, you, the Russian ones. Yeah, what, what I'm saying is, you can use the language like putting two words together. Oh, a, you mean they would have create... independently come up with the word "cool shrunk" and not had yeah, to borrow? Yeah, right. Not all languages. Not all languages function. English does not function like that. I think all all words, words in English are like loan words. But German can uh, and Icelandic can create. Yeah, I think German, Turkish, and Thai are the only three languages that do that a lot. Uh, Icelandic does it all the time. Let me okay. give an example. Let me give an example. But that's a Germanic um, language too. So yeah, yeah. Uh, let me give an example. Uh, for example, the Icelandic word for computer is tölva. Töl Tölur, töl means numerical, number. Ölva is a derivative from völva, which is like a, a heathen oracle. So you put these two words together, tölva, you get a computer. You get a so, number oracle. Number All right, well. Or, yeah. All right, well, but uh, I, I'm not sure when this process began, but certainly uh, by the 1920s and 30s, uh, adopting uh, Russian loanwords and the uh, 
the Volga German dialect was was pretty well on its way. We, we and, disdain and so, loan words here. We we hate them. We we are always trying. To <laughs> We are always trying to purge every loan word we can. We like, and th there was actually like Ataturk was his, uh, there will be no Arabic or Persian words in the Turkish language. Yeah, th I think there was like a there was like a purging effort in the 1700s. Like all Danish loan words were purged systematically. Uh, well, not, uh, in Turkey, they tried to get, but the, something they couldn't get rid of because it just wouldn't work. Like the word for olive, zeytun, is, is still an Arabic loan word. Yeah, yeah. But a few languages you can get away with no loan words, like German is one of them. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know why they didn't come up with uh, independent compound words for technological innovations and why yeah, they that's adopted weird. Russian. Like why, why did they just lazy, you know, physically, <laughs> no, no effort. <laughs> well, and, and here's a here's a question too regarding sort of preservation of, of culture is for many of those Volga Germans having some degree of separation, did they, because, okay, so let's say someone's in Germany and then they move to the east, they become a Volga German, they stay in their town um, and then famine strikes and they move to the U.S., but then they're still retaining their their much older conception of themselves on a more local sense did, what i'm i guess wondering it is did that create an effect whereby you know they didn't go through the sort of volkish movement of sort of german nationalism so was there was that sort of a diaspora effect of preserving this more ancient hyper local identity yeah i think so uh so, I mean, yeah, you're right that up until uh, the 20th century, most of this identification is on the, the level of the village. So people would say they're from Frank or they're from uh, Varenberg or they're from Norca, right? So there isn't this, even a concept of, of, of the larger you know, Volga German area. I mean, that literally hmm. is created uh, in its... Uh, as a with borders and uh, a a, a uh, administrative unit by Lenin, and so we're talking 1918. Uh, yeah, they, they they don't they don't and they don't even think of themselves as a distinct uh, diaspora, as it were, separate from hmm. uh, other German. Uh, group which there's not much contact with until they are uprooted and dispersed across Siberia and Kazakhstan in 1941. And then you have, since they are systematically persecuted for being Germans, their geographical origin is pretty irrelevant as far as the government in Moscow is concerned. It like reinforces it in their head. So the they are Germans and they are living in what the Soviet Union and their ancestors came to the Russian Empire. Uh, so one of the reasons why they use the term Russian German rather than Soviet German is basically a rejection of the Soviet regime because of the persecution starting in the 19... Well, it starts earlier, but I mean, it gets, it, in 1941, there's a total ethnic cleansing of the European parts of the Soviet Union of ethnic Germans. Uh, so there had been earlier in 37, 38, there was a German operation with a, a large number are shot and executed for allegedly being German spies. And the, there's a, a lot of them are uh, uprooted in 1930 and 1931 for being quote unquote kulaks. Uh, but uh, after 41, you know, almost all of the German population uh, is persecuted uh, in some way because they are Germans. Oh, okay. So is so this is almost a more retrospective way of viewing, I guess, Germans as a whole. Um, I, I guess if you go back much further, you have you do have this conception of of the Germanics. I mean, this is a very this isn't. It's not like the idea sprung out of nowhere, but. Um, right, but this is not how people in the villages in the Volga and Ukraine speaking 
uh, 18th uh, and 19th century dialects of German conceived of themselves, right? So they had almost no political links uh, with Germany uh, until uh, after the start of the First World War. So, and then okay. the Germans, they occupied Ukraine and there becomes the first connection. And you, you see there is a diaspora that comes out and there are some very influential ethnic Germans from the Black Sea region, such as uh, uh, Georg Leibbrandt and uh, Stump, uh, who uh, become influential in the National Socialist government and with regard to their policies towards ethnic Germans in, in the areas they occupy in the Soviet Union, particularly Ukraine, because they obviously uh, do not get to the Volga. Uh, and even if they had, the, all the Germans had already been deported in September of 41 into Siberia and Kazakhstan. I, I have one question. Uh, what was the attitude of like these Lutheran uh, Volga Germans, like marrying Mennonites? Was that as uh, controversial as, as Catholic, you know, marrying Catholic? It or? was, but there, there are far fewer Mennonites. There are only uh, at most 10% of the German population in the Russian Empire and Soviet Union. Uh, and the Mennonites uh, themselves are, are, are much more uh, closed to outsiders than, than, the, uh, than the Lutherans or Catholics. Uh, so you see uh, when they migrate to the Western Hemisphere, there are still you know, Mennonite settlements and communities that can trace back their origins to Ukraine uh, and, and other parts of the Russian Empire in Canada, in Chihuahua, Mexico, uh, where they're still speaking uh, the old dialect of German, uh, in Paraguay, uh, where a lot left uh, in 1929, the last uh, uh, legal uh, exodus for until uh, after World War II. Uh, so, uh, the Mennonites, uh, particularly those in Latin America, uh, but also some in, in isolated areas of Canada, uh, have done the best to really preserve the old ways. Uh, and in part because the, the Mennonites have set themselves up, you know, as kind of rejecting the modern world to begin with. Exactly. And, and I, also, I also heard, though, like a rumor, I'm not sure if it's true, but I heard that like during the, you know, the Blitzkrieg in the Eastern Front that, you know, a few SS officers apparently took Mennonite waifus in, in when they countered these communities in Russia. Is that true? Or? I don't know. Um, I heard that, you know, they... they... I, I know that during the First World War, uh, the attacks by uh, the forces under Nestor Machna in 1919 against the Mennonites were so bad uh, that the Mennonites uh, organized uh, armed uh, units, uh, uh, these kind of Schutzgruppen, uh, to protect their communities. And this was a huge deal coming from a, a community, one of their pillars of faith is, is, is uh, extreme pacifism. So uh, that was facilitated by the imperial government of Germany uh, a little bit earlier before it fell in 1918. Uh, by uh, leaving weapons for them. But uh, uh, during the Second World War, there are a number of Mennonites that work with the National Socialists, uh, particularly as translators. Uh, not so many, obviously, since they're pacifists in, in a military capacity uh, as, uh, as fighting men. But uh, there were a number of uh, Mennonites who were saved from deportation into Kazakhstan uh, in 1941 by the Wehrmacht who uh, worked with the German uh, authorities as translators because they knew uh, Russian and in some cases Ukrainian. Hmm. I, I suppose now that we're starting to enter World War II, the, I wanted to ask you because I someone had recommended to me a while back the book, the 1947 book, Gruesome Harvest, which detailed accounts of 
the aftermath for Germans in in and around Germany after the Second World War. And I, I was curious if you had any familiarity with this book. If, um, if I wasn't sure necessarily the, I wanted to kind of find out more about the reliability of it because it was very hard. It cites a lot of um, sources from the time and newspapers and so forth, but it's a lot of. Stuff uh, if you're talking about you know, Germany proper and the retrieving a. Uh, probably the best place to start would be uh, Dezeus's book, uh, Nemesis at Potsdam, and then look at his sources. So he's got a kind of a unique view in that uh, he was a kind of a, a international human rights lawyer, still is. I think he lives in Switzerland, but he's a Cuban American. He doesn't have, as far as I know, uh, any German ancestry, although he, he does speak the language fluently. Uh, but he did the first uh, kind of in-depth book in English to academically look at uh, the expulsions from uh, Eastern Germany uh, and uh, Czechoslovakia at the end of the war and the role, uh, particularly the United States and Great Britain, in uh, uh, facilitating that uh, with the Soviets. Uh, so... That I think is the might be the best place to start since the first uh, serious academic work with lots of footnotes going back to German language uh, sources uh, published in English. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, what's interesting is that in the in the book it cites um, the the conservative newsletter Review of World Affairs, which estimated that um, something like um, 15 million people had been deported. Uh, That's pretty about, close. Yeah, about 4 million men and women had been deported to Eastern Europe and Russia for slave labor. That sounds and, high. I, I, I mean, the figures we have from the Soviet archives are not complete, uh, but uh, uh, unless you're including prisoners of war, Four million would be too high. Okay, yeah, I just, and that's kind of why one of the things I wanted to ask because it was, you know, it, it's it was certainly a very interesting read and kind of gave me a perspective, or gave certainly an interesting perspective on the the very hellish aftermath for Germans, well, both both in the West and East, because at least according to the accounts of the book, a lot of German civilians and former soldiers were used in slave labor. Both oh, they definitely well. were. Uh, uh, so, yeah, if, you, if you're counting prisoners of war, uh, as that is uh, soldiers in the Wehrmacht and, and Waffen-SS uh, who were interned in Group V camps, and that number uh, sounds about right. If you're just talking about uh, civilians who were uh, part of this reparation through labor, uh, then the number, of course, is, is way too high. Uh, so I, I don't have, as I said, the figures, are, the, 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 the data is incomplete, uh, but uh, it looks like it's in the hundreds of thousands uh, from East Prussia, Silesia, uh, about 75,000 from uh, Romania, 30,000 from Hungary, uh, 12,000 from Yugoslavia, which is low because the communist government under Tito wanted to use them for his own slave labor projects rather than share them with Stalin. Yeah, you, you have this sort of clawing both for land and human capital in some sense, I suppose. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah well, anyway, yeah, I, that's a bit of an aside, but I just wanted to, wanted to kind of bring that up. Um. Yeah, uh, uh, one other question I had is, do, you, do we have a sense of the population sizes throughout the 20th century? So, say, by the end of the Soviet Union, any idea of the total number of um, Germans living in Officially, Soviet the 1989 census, about 2 million people. Uh, identified themselves as being German by Nazi almost in the USSR. Now, 
that figure is probably low because the dis discrimination continued all the way up to the end of the Soviet Union, particularly for uh, admissions to universities and uh, getting uh, uh, white collar jobs. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, you you can't like just make up your 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 ethnicity. You had to choose one of the uh, one of that one of your parents. So only in the cases of mixed marriages, right, is there an option to get out of being German. Uh, but there were uh, increasing numbers of those in the late Soviet period. So uh, a lot of people who had uh, a, a one parent who was Russian or Ukrainian, another was German, had put the Slavic parent, uh, and then they would later try and change it uh, after 87 so that they could uh, leave uh, to go to Germany as a Aussiedler or Spade Aussiedler. Uh, so the, 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 the number from the census is officially a little less than 2 million about how many people of mixed parentage uh, there were that were did not identify as German in the 89 census or the earlier census is, is not something we have exact information on. Yeah, and, and you had a guest on, on your show um, a couple times talking about the experience of growing up in, in Kazakhstan as... Uh, as a German, uh, and do you want to touch a little bit on kind of what day-to-day -day life was for a lot of Germans in in the Soviet Union in Russia? Uh, what time period are we talking? Um, well, yeah, I suppose it varies quite a bit. Uh, post, well, you have had the the train rides uh, just shipping. Yeah, well, immediately after the train ride, things were horrible for about. 14 years, 15 years. Uh, and then they start to get a little bit better. Uh, but, uh, you know, they were dumped out there. And then if that weren't enough, then they were mobilized in the Turavaya Aramia or Trud Army, as it's uh, kind of a shrunken into. Uh, it's a, kind of a weird. It's, the Soviets have weird Russian acronyms and that they don't always uh, have correspondence one letter to one letter. So uh, this is uh, one of those contractions. But uh, yes, uh, things only start to get uh, improve uh, really is under Khrushchev. So they officially pardoned and uh, removed from the special settlement restrictions on 13th of December, 1955. Uh, and uh, they're told this, most of them, uh, in January and February, 1956. Uh, and February 56 is Khrushchev denounces uh, Stalin in the secret party Congress. And he mentions the deportation of a number of groups, but he does not mention the Germans. Uh, and uh, the decree uh, releasing the special settlement does not let them leave to go back to where they were deported from, nor does it allow them to petition for uh, redress regarding the massive loss of uh, private and collective property they suffered. Uh, so there's a brief period where this is a, kind of the German elite in the Soviet Union uh, attempting to uh, petition the Soviet government, particularly Mikoyev, who was made the point man, interestingly enough. And the rumor is Mikoyev abstained on all the national deportations and all the other members of the Politburo voted yes. And the reason this is, uh, he did this, they suspect, but they can't prove what the votes were is because he, being an Armenian, was well aware of what had happened to his own people in the Ottoman Empire during World War I. Uh, so in the post-Stalin uh, era, Khrushchev era, uh, the Crimean Tatars and Mesketian Turks and uh, the Volga Germans all uh, meet with him. Uh, but he tells them, he quite honest, he says, we can't let you go back to the Volga 
because if you leave northern Kazakhstan, its economy will collapse. We don't have any other reliable permanent workforce there. Hmm. And chat, I want to know if you guys have questions for Otto or for us. Feel free to drop those in chat. That'd be much appreciated. Um, the other thing I'm curious about, too, is what is the current state of the... You said there's something like, I think at one point, there's something like 400,000 Germans living in Russia today. Is that... Is yes. That, it's a, it's okay. a little less than 400,000, mostly in Western Siberia, Altai Krai, Omsk Oblast, Novosibirsk Oblast. There was an autonomous... Uh, Territory it was one of the ones under the Soviets that had been reestablished. That was uh, actually Mennonite settlement in Siberia from uh, the Tsarist time called Hobstadt. It's in Altai. And there was a new one that was established in Omsk called Osovov. And these get uh, funding from the German government for uh, cultural uh, and other uh, activities. Uh, the German government uh, in recent years has been trying to uh, provide assistance to these uh, Germans remaining in the Russian uh, Russia uh, rather than have them uh, join the massive <laughs> two and a half to three and a half million uh, Russian Germans already in Germany. Hmm. Is is the thought process behind this to prevent? Well, I, I suppose crowding wouldn't make sense because they they take in quite a lot of immigrants. So. Uh, like non so I... yeah, it's uh, there's a lot of reasons behind it. Uh, one a lot of reason, politics of yeah, yeah. Well, one reason is that they want to keep them there as a bridge between Russia and Germany, uh, particularly mm. for uh, economic uh, trade. Uh, and this is not uh, unique to Germany. Uh, the ethnic Koreans uh, in the Russia as well as Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, uh, have a similar role between South Korea and the post-Soviet states. Uh, another reason is, uh, as time has gone on, uh, the Germans uh, coming back to Germany, the returnees, the spate Aussiedler, have been more and more culturally Russified, particularly linguistically but also many of them having uh, non-German spouses. Uh, and so the, the, one of the ideas is if, if, if they need to be re-Germanized, we can do it in uh, Russia rather than uh, in hmm. Germany. In, in some sense, they may, and again, kind of as, the, as a diaspora being functioning as a time capsule, I do wonder if in some sense these... Germans in Russia, these German settlements might have, uh, in looking forward, let's say a hundred years, may carry over more kind of classical German culture than you know a lot of modern day Germany or Germans elsewhere. I mean, uh, well, I mean realistic. It's, part of the problem here is the use of the term German because. Uh, and also use the term diaspora. Basically, we're talking there are numerous kind of that were subdivisions culturally within Germany and within yeah. the various German speaking diasporas. So, uh, as I said, you know, the, the idea that there was one group of Germans in Russia or even one group in the Volga is a fairly modern idea, right? Earlier would have been there were multiple groups. Uh, there are still, I mean, you still see this uh, today uh, in the United States. Uh, uh, areas that are settled, for instance, by Volga Germans like Hayes, Kansas, and areas settled by Black Sea Germans like Vishik, in North Dakota. Uh, there's a lot of minor differences in the types of cuisine. Uh, differences in the traditional dialect, uh, particularly uh, vocabulary, uh, and uh, differences in things like music and dance. So, uh, I mean, Germany uh, and the German diasporas were very heterodox. They, they weren't homogenized. To, I mean, Today, everything's been, been so homogenized. We have almost like, you know, one dominant uh, 
global American empire culture. Uh, but uh, even the sort of airport, airport. Yeah, but, uh, but even until you know. 1990 or so, you know, you could still talk about different subregions of Germany itself, Saxony and Thuringia, the DDR, uh, Byron and the Bayard Day as having uh, their own kind of distinct subcultures uh, that were not, uh, you know, all cookie cutter out of Berlin. Yeah, well, and you see, well, in, in America too, with the First World War and Second World War, I mean, German going from being um, as well-spoken as English here to being, you know, pretty much, unless you go to, say, an Amish community and you, you speak to someone in their own very strange dialect of German, um, I mean, you, re you really don't see the same sort of, like, German folk festivals here that you do. I mean, you're more likely to see, even though there's far less of them, you're more likely to see a Swedish folk festival or you know just I mean, well, it's well, pretty because, rare to follow that's because minnesota is was not one of the original areas of settlement for germans they, they kind of spilled over from north dakota but uh if you go to some areas you do see that so if you go to uh lincoln nebraska you see a lot of volga german uh mm. cultural events because the american historical society of germans from russia is there but that's also a city where when they were leaving the Russian Empire in the 19th century, the railroad decided the people leaving anyway and started directly recruiting them. So the, the bottoms, the areas were, were flooded by the river in Lincoln, Nebraska, where at one time all Volga Germans. Uh, now they're obviously uh, very multicultural, but uh, there's still a heavy Volga German uh influence in, in Lincoln, Nebraska. And you can see the same thing with, uh, for instance, the uh, Germans from the Kingdom of Hungary in places like Cincinnati and St. Louis, uh, and some cities in uh, uh, central and southern Illinois. Uh, so it, so it does Brazil, exist. Brazil has their odd, uh, on occasion you'll see the, uh, the odd German <laughs> settlement there. Well, you know, Argentina is really big. So Entre de Rios, uh, basically a Volga German settlement. They still kind of kept all the old ways. Uh, there's a lot of Volga German uh, 19th century culture uh, preserved in uh, parts of Argentina. So I, I know some, some German musicians. Uh, they still sing all the old Volga German songs on the old... Uh, Volga German uh, instruments, uh, Hammer Dusselmeyer. Are most of the German settlers in America, are these primarily of Volga German descent? No, a lot came from the Black Sea, a lot came from, yeah. from, from Volhynia. Uh, so it, it depends where. So Kansas and Nebraska and Colorado are had a lot of settlements that came from the Volga. But North Dakota had a lot from the Black Sea region. So uh, Russian Germans in North Dakota are mostly from the Black Sea region in Ukraine uh, ancestry. Yeah. Uh, there's some other uh, areas you have, I'd have to go look through it. The, the settlement in the United States isn't my specialty, but there are quite a few people that, that, that do it because uh, genealogy is a uh, obsession with Americans of German from Russia heritage. Oh, most certainly, most certainly, yeah. And just anecdotally, yeah, the most most of the Germans I've met that know their background from from my area, a lot of them are Baltic, Baltic Germans. So yeah, no, that's that's fascinating. Um, kind of going back to my questions here. Um, uh, yeah, what, what was the ideal, or actually going back to an even earlier question, when, at the, at the end of World War II, when the Soviet Union is deporting and moving just entire nations, what were their key goals? I mean, one, neutralize, I suppose, neutralize a potential threat, mobilize a workforce, but was there any was there the hope that these communities would eventually dissolve or they'd become 
Yeah, like, I think what was so. The, what was the thought process? Uh, well, for the Germans specifically, I think it was to make sure that the, they could not ever uh, be used as a uh, asset for any German state or government existing. Uh, so this is kind of an excuse to have a final solution to the German problem in the Soviet Union. Uh, I also think uh, it was a way to uh, get rid of a population that had never really been uh, Sovietized, particularly uh, economically, but also socially, uh, and things like religion. So if they were ripped off from their homeland, the, the roots to the, the soil cut and dispersed across Kazakhstan and Siberia, uh, in the process, a number of them dying uh, through uh, malnutrition and, and uh, disease and, of course, uh, forced labor in the, the labor army, and that it would basically uh, remove any potential problem uh, mm. of this large diaspora that had uh, an ethnic and cultural connection uh, to uh, Germany, even though the most of the Germans in the Soviet Union really had no political affinity uh, ever with any government in Germany. Uh, the, the one exception uh, you see is interesting is uh, there is established uh, a Sonderkommando R, a Sonderkommando uh, Ruslan, which is a uh, SS unit in Transnistria. Uh, and it is established by Himmler because the, their Romanian ally the pillaged and uh, looted all the German villages when they came into Ukraine. Uh, and so the Germans weren't very happy about this. Uh, but uh, they participated in the massacre at Bogdanova, which was a, a concentration camp with about 25,000 Jews in it. Now, the official reason was to prevent the spread of typhus from the camp into the general population. Uh, but uh, a friend of mine who is a Black Sea German ancestry in North Dakota interviewed a number of these men. And every single one of them, when asked why they did it, they said revenge for what the communists had done to their families in the 1920s and 1930s, the, the Holodomor, the dekulakization, mm. and the German operation in 37 and 38. Uh, the, this was revenge uh, against Jewish communists for their participation in Soviet atrocities against ethnic Germans before World War II started. And is, to a large extent, a lot of the uh, atrocities and mass movements and so forth, is a lot of this during that era, these kind of underlying ethnic tensions that are then just sort of you put sort of put into terms of ideological, you know, the ideological aims of, of the Soviets or the Germans at that time? Is that kind of what you find? Or I suppose, especially with the Soviets, the Germans were more explicit. Uh, say it one more time. Like, so, kind, yeah, kind sorry, I, exp I, I was wording things poorly. So was a lot of the, especially when it comes to, say, the, the Soviet attempts to fragment and um, suppress the Germans and the various atrocities that were committed against the Germans, was a lot of this put into Soviet language and put into sort of ideological communist terminology Yeesh. rather than... No, it actually, as early as 1929, it started to become blatantly just ethnic and racial. Oh, so Soviet okay. part against the German. As early as 1929, you have the first decree mentioning uh, uh, Nationalnost as a criteria for expelling kulaks. Uh, oh. This is from Nikolaya Oblast in Ukraine during the uh, uh, forced collectivization. And they start talking about Germans as kulaks uh, from 29 and 30 and 31. Uh, and there's all kinds of, of reports of the people carrying out the, the dekulakization of the OGPU using all kinds of, of ethnic and racial slurs against ethnic Germans uh, and also ethnic Poles as they're, they're removing them from, from their, 
their farms and sending them to the far north for the Urals. Okay, yeah, so it was much more, just much more blatant, much more, instead of, you know, we're we're going after these people because they're they're the Kulaks, and we're... Well, I mean, like the Kulak if, if they, they, they become, they become kind of uh, merged, because particularly in the Black Sea region, the Germans were extraordinarily successful agriculturally, and were very prosperous compared mm -hmm. to their uh, Ukrainian uh, and Russian neighbors. Yeah, and... Oh, sorry, I lost. I lost my train of thought there. Uh, Fiona, were you were you trying to say something? No, no, no. I just. <laughs> All right, no problem, no problem. Uh, yeah. So Michael Dishman in chat says he has a great grandfather from Hesse, Germany, who was a mercenary for the British during the American Revolution. Okay, so a Hessian, very cool. He became a POW after the Battle of Saratoga. Then he built a home in Blacksburg, Virginia. Wow, yeah, that's pretty interesting. Oh, it still stands today? I've been to Blacksburg. That's where uh, Virginia Tech is. Oh, okay. Excellent. Um, what do you see as being the, the future of Germans in the various diaspora groups of Germans uh, going forward? I mean, it's, it's hard to predict these sorts of things, but do you see... Um, I don't know. Do you do you see certain trends in in the east as well, far as Germans? Well, the escalation? mass migration both out of Russia and Kazakhstan seems to have basically ended. So, about four hundred thousand remaining in mostly Siberia and close to two hundred thousand in northern Kazakhstan. Uh, so it was, that's stabilized, uh, and there is. Um, you know, this kind of revival or renaissance of some sorts, uh, particularly in, in Russia, uh, by these groups. And it does have uh, a stamp of approval of the Russian government as well as support from the German government. So the, the current Russian government, unlike the Soviet government uh, under Stalin, uh, does uh, recognize these various uh, cultural groups uh, and institutions, uh, some of them funded by the German government previously, although I don't know uh, how German-Russian relations regarding Berlin and Moscow are going to shake out given Berlin's support of uh, Ukraine. Yeah, no, that's that's very much kind of an open, open question going forward, um, which really kind of comes down to what's, America's relationship with Ukraine, I suppose, to a large extent. But I don't see this uh, negatively affecting the Russian domestic policies towards its German population. So uh, a lot of the Russian Germans, uh, both in Russia and Germany, uh, are rather sympathetic to Russia because, uh, you know, it's kind of, there's, there's various ways to explain it. Uh, I, uh, Lena Wolf talked about the uh, Ruthland Deutschen as being uh, on a Heimat without a homeland. But another way to look at it is they have two homelands, the Valrod in the Russian homeland and the German homeland. I think also the, the Russian Confederation, it, it gives, it tends to give, I think, I'm not, I don't know much about this area, but doesn't it give a bit of more, much more autonomy to the, the various ethnic groups that live there? Uh, it, if if they, they have a territory, yes, but the Germans only have two small districts, one in Altai and one in Ops. They don't have a republic mm -hmm. like the Volga Tatars or the Bashkirs or the Biryats or the Kalmuks uh, and, or the Chechens, in which case you have a huge amount of de facto uh, autonomy. Uh, so it, 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 the Volga German ASSR, uh, Volga German Republic, was never restored. Uh, there were attempts, the last the big attempts were under Yeltsin, and the Yeltsin government was uh, particularly uh, very strongly opposed to granting any type of autonomy uh, to Volga Germans. Is there, do you know if there's any desire for forming a republic today? 
Um, or uh, you know, the, the it's kind of dissipated because the, the old people that actually remember living in the Volga, only a very few of them are left alive. Mm. Uh, and so what has happened, and this starts already in the early 1970s, is that the idea is that uh, we just leave. If we can't be, be German, if we're going to be discriminated against for being German in uh, the Soviet Union, then we just uh, migrate to uh, West Germany. Uh, and in the 1990s, you see this huge flood with the majority of the uh, population of Russian Germans leaves uh, primarily Kazakhstan is the largest area where they come from as far as numbers. Uh, and then uh, uh, Siberia, uh, about half of them leave. And then almost all of them from other Central Asian republics. So uh, Kyrgyzstan in, in 1989 had over 100,000 ethnic Germans. It, today, it's like less than 8,000. Wow, that's, yeah, I mean, that, I had no idea it was that big of a that big of a shift in population. Yeah, well, Tajikistan went from thirty thousand to zero basically because of the civil war and the takeover by the Islamists. Is there any significant German popu ethnic German population within the Ukraine today? Uh, there are some uh, uh, number who had uh, managed to to return. Then the western part uh, was annexed from uh, Hungary at the end of the Second World War, the Carpathians. There was no deportation of the ethnic Germans there. So the, uh, ironically, there were about 10,000 Germans uh, in the westernmost part of the Soviet Union that were neither deported eastward nor put under special settlement restrictions like the ones that were living in Kazakhstan and Central Asia before a 1941 war. Uh, but it's not huge. Uh, I think a, a number returned to Ukraine, but I think it's maybe 2,000, 3,000. I mean, Crimea, uh, 2,000 to 3,000. So not a lot. But for the most part, uh, the German communities uh, in the Russian Federation are in Western Siberia. Uh, and most of the population, uh, the center that you were internationally, uh, is moved from the Soviet Union, particularly Kazakhstan, into Germany itself now. Are those in Western Siberia primarily, is that primarily agricultural as far as... Well, that's where they were deported to. Uh, yeah. So in 1941, uh, of the almost 500,000 Volga Germans including those from Saratov and Stalingrad Oblast, as well as the Volga, uh, about 400,000 were deported into Siberia and 100,000 into northern Kazakhstan. Uh, and then there's about another 100,000 Russian Germans from other regions of the European USSR deported into Siberia, uh, although most of those people end up in Kazakhstan. So... Uh, it were before the mass uh, exodus began in from 1987 on about 600,000 ethnic germans in siberia hmm. interesting yeah that's that's so are these kind of ghost towns now with uh, uh, well it depends i mean there are some but they're most uh, i mean there are like Places in the Volga, particularly, uh, where you can go and you can see, you know, particularly churches that are kind of half destroyed uh, or that were converted for other purposes and then abandoned. Uh, but uh, I, I don't think uh, in Siberia there's been... Uh, whole villages abandoned by the emigration, in part because uh, they were deported to already existing Russian villages. And in fact, they were housed in already existing and, and uh, inhabited Russian houses. And one of the problems, you know, these people in uh, Kazakhstan and Siberia, uh, all of a sudden these huge waves of people start coming in and get the, all their spare rooms taken up. 
And some of these people were punished deportees, like the Germans. Others were refugees. Uh, others were uh, people uh, arriving in various ways. But um, uh, you read a book, the first, uh, I guess, memoir uh, by a German woman deported into Kazakhstan called the uh, Memoirs of Kazakhstan, oh, memoirs of, it's written by Berta Bachmann, who was Eugen Bachmann, the, uh, who established the first post-World uh, War II Lutheran church in the Soviet Union, it was established in Kazakhstan. But uh, his wife wrote her memoirs about uh, being deported to Kazakhstan, but they were towed in houses already, how with Kazakhs already lived. And they didn't speak each other's language and uh, there was a lot of tension here because of, of, of that. Yeah, and in the when you were speaking to Lena Wolf, it was interesting. She described that uh, a lot of the or the the view of the Germans who had lived or who were living in Kazakhstan was that they were essentially just sort of considered even though they were growing up in the Soviet administrative and schooling apparatus, they were still uh, the sort of slur term would have been just calling them Nazis. Essentially. Was that, was that a pretty common experience for most? Yeah. Uh, all the way up on, uh, to the uh, end of the Soviet union. Uh, fascist would probably have been more common than Nazi okay. because uh, a Nazi has the word socialist in, in it there. So they kind of want to avoid that, that term, but fascist Fritz's, uh, been this type of, of uh, uh, you know, verbal abuse and sometimes uh, physical attacks. So there was a good book written uh, uh, by, I can't remember her name, she's a Baltic woman. Uh, but uh, she wrote it in the 80s, but she interviewed a number of German Aussiedler from Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. And she said already in the 1970s, you know, uh, Germans in Kyrgyzstan would be subject to physical attack by, by Kyrgyz gangs with knives. And I worked on an asylum case, a guy named uh, Vladimir German, uh, who was a German from Kazakhstan, who would come to the United States uh, on a family reunification visa and bought his wife and kids and they applied for asylum uh, and then it was being pending forever uh, and then the government uh i believe this is the clinton administration denied it after they had been here like i don't think it was almost 20 years <laughs> oh, wow yeah they had a wow. house their kids had gone all the way through high school it was it was it wasn't 20 it was more than 10 years it was like a very long time uh, he had a job as a mechanic and in fact his, his boss was the one who who started contacting people when they said they were going to port them because they panicked because there was nobody else who knew how to work on diesel engines. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, we won that case by, by act of the judge seeing God. Uh, but he had been physically attacked in a factory oh, for wow. being German. Uh, Kazakh uh, had uh, taken a uh, piece of metal rebar and, and thrust it through his chest. So almost killed him. Wow. Uh, and what was the, because the Wehrmacht never made it to Kazakhstan, did they? No, they did not. But a the, lot of Kazakhs fought in the Soviet Red Army. But there's also, and you see this starting in the 70s, this idea that Kazakhstan is the land for Kazakhs. And Kazakh oh, is an no. ethno-racial group. Uh, and one of the things the Soviet government of Brezhnev tried to do was carve out a German autonomous oblast in Kazakhstan. And the reason it didn't work is because the Kazakh communists organized uh, through the university professors massive anti-German demonstrations among Kazakh university students. And so you had this kind of uh, the land of Kazakhstan cannot be given to non-Kazakhs, and that being a racial definition. Hmm. I, I'm and, thinking. Uh, sorry, I'm thinking like if uh, relations between Germany and Russia continue to sour further. Uh, you know, you think it's like possible that many Germans who are not 
in favor of the current regime in Berlin will just try to reestablish these old colonies in Russia. And maybe it would be like a, you know, I'm not endorsing anything, but that is speculative. Like maybe it would be like a, like a good political move for, for the Kremlin to just invite them over to a sort of like a, kind of like a fuck you to, well, to yeah, Berlin. Could, uh, <laughs> yeah. repeat, repeat of Catherine the second's manifesto. Yeah, so you just, you just drain Germany of the most productive people, you know, and cut off the pipeline or something. You know, they, it's just interesting, interesting to think about this. And I mean, these colonies might actually survive because there, there, so there was a Russian politician, a somewhat prominent Russian politician that put out some sort of, and again, I don't know the details of Russian day to day politics, so I have no idea how serious this was. But had put out some call that um, Americans or uh, American Americans of European descent could. There was some talk about, hey, you know, we've got some space in Siberia. Uh, if you if you're feeling discriminated against in America, come over to Russia and set up a set up a community. I I do remember seeing that as a as an article in a few places. So. It's not outside. I, I wouldn't think it's outside of the realm of possibility. Well, you know, it, it's happened before in the uh, 1920s. The, the Soviet government actively tried to get uh, particularly Volga Germans, but other Russian Germans that were in the United States to come back. Oh, uh, yeah. So with the, they sent delegations uh, and then, uh, from the Volga German ASSR trying to convince people the czar is gone and it's all paradise uh, you know we have our own ethnic republic and uh, you can speak german and and uh, you know uh, there's a german history and, and culture and folklore and whatnot is, is promoted and to an extent that was true although it was in a very sovietized uh, style uh very different from the very religious uh centered uh, life that these people had uh, been used to in the Tsarist Russia and the United States. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, this was the, 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 the appeal. And the very, very, very few, I don't even know if it was even 100 out of the, the 300,000 that left Tsarist Russia decided to return <laughs> after the Soviets took power. It was almost nobody wanted to live under communism. <laughs> I, I think the best thing at least Viktor Orban can do is, you know, at least, you know, reestablish the, the Danube Swabian, you know, colonies or, or the, the that area, you know, because that would be the best way for him to say, you know, fuck you to the EU. And, you know, he has repeatedly, like, encouraged, like, people to move to Hungary who are against like multiculturalism and stuff like that. And I think Putin also, like before before the war. So maybe he will, he will like, re at least maybe Putin will like reestablish these, uh, give the Germans actually a, their own oblast, their own, um, republic. you know, republic in, inside the, the Federation where all German dissidents would just migrate to. That's that's actually a real possibility, especially if the tensions continue to escalate. I mean, who knows? Yes, uh, it's a possibility. I just haven't heard anything about it. One of the yeah. great things about being a historian is I don't have to predict the future, just the past. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's pretty excellent. Yeah. Um, the other question, and this is kind of my last thing that I, I wanted to bring up for the stream. Um, and again, yeah. Any comments in chat, we'll, we'll be sure to get to. But, and this, again, this isn't even really a, this is much more of a personal assessment. To what extent has, and this is something I've been trying to wrap my brain around for a while, is to what extent did the American ethnogenesis of this sort of Northwest European culture to what extent did that succeed and to what extent is there going to be maybe backsliding of that wherein as what it means to be an american becomes increasingly fragmented um I, you know if someone says they're an american it doesn't tell you necessarily what their religion is 
uh, what their ethnic background is, what their political values are, um, what their language is even. Is there going to be this sort of, is, the, is this sort of attempt at an American ethnogenesis going to continue or will this be, there be this shift back until it, where you maybe have certain regions and communities saying, oh, we're, we're uh, essentially more German or we're more Irish or Scots-Irish or we're more yes. Anglo. That's that's yeah. a question I had to speculate. Yeah, on. I mean, I, I dealt with this on uh, my YouTube uh, station extensively is to when we talk about white Americans, uh, how, how much of an ethnos are we as opposed to just a, a racial category? And, and we seem to have been seriously disrupted. There was a lot of progress of this kind of merging of of Germans and Scandinavians and English and other Northern, uh, Central and Western European uh, dis descendants of immigrants from those countries in the United States. Uh, but then, you know, the whole positive of idea, you know, we'll kind of create a, this kind of European American, Americana uh, nationality kind of just never got anywhere. I mean, you, you see, you know, where you have the creation of these kind of new national nations from European immigrants in places like Quebec from the French or South Africa, the Afrikaners, mostly Dutch, but with, you know, some Germans and some French Huguenots and others. But in the United States, uh, it, it seems that, uh, it, you know, we kind of just never got beyond. So there, there are Americans and there are Americans who are white but there's like no content to that as far as yeah. it compared to say being an Afrikaner or a Quebecois. Uh, and I think that's the real problem. Now, obviously, I don't think that for the vast majority of non-whites that there can ever be like a total assimilation into the same nation as European Americans. You can have some, but most people who are African descent or uh, you know, the Metitos who are uh, mixed Indian and Spanish, uh, they are not going to opt to be part of our nation if, if we could ever create one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It just, it seems like the, because you have the, the 1965 Heart Cellar Immigration Act, and then it sort of accelerates the process at a rate to which you get this kind of fragment, refragmentation, or, and maybe you haven't seen the, ref maybe there hasn't been much of a refragmentation yet, but I do wonder if there that is on the horizon at some point um, because it, it does. The refragmentation like the would be a, be more positive than what I'm thinking is going to happen. I'm thinking we're just going to be more atomized, more deracinated. Well, I, I, I mean, what, what it becomes is, I mean, perhaps it, what will happen is, you know, we the only identity we have is, is it becomes like the Russian Germans. Yeah, yeah, we identify as being white because we're persecuted for it. Which is like the absolute worst reason to identify with the, with your your, your ancestry. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that's that's very insightful. And and also like, what's the shared mythos if you're if you're like? Well, we don't white. have one. That's one of our problems. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking like white American. Is it the ones that sailed to the Mayflower and fought in the Revolutionary War because that's one group of white Americans, or is it the Italian immigrants that came in the like twentieth century? Is it, is it like there are so many different groups that there's no shared mythos, founding <laughs> mythos, or, or no shared yeah. sense of struggle, or no, like the only right. heat or our we characters are like, completely at all, unlike yeah. say the Afrikaners or Quebecois. So, yeah, we are we are in a, 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 a bad shape as being that when you talk about white Americans, uh, Americaners, there is no ethnos there. Right, so yeah, I, I would actually agree that that white Americans is not an ethnos. It's just a collection of different ethnos that still, to a large degree, haven't assimilated that much. Now they are still relatively separate. I think. Like, like well, I don't even know. Yeah, I mean, they're separate, but, but the, a lot of that has, of course, been lost. So we, yeah, we're yeah, just yeah, atomized that. individuals that happen to. Yeah be descended of European immigrants and have white skin. But, but the, a positive content for any type of, of developing an ethnogenesis is, is missing. And that's one of the reasons I think we're in such big 
Trouble. Yeah, exactly. So well, and yeah, you bring up the Mayflower mythos too, because I that reminds me of kind of growing up in school because I was you know in elementary and so forth. You're you're sort of raised a lot with the stories of of the Mayflower and so forth, and it's kind of funny because you know as a small child I always thought of myself as oh yeah you know we're from the Mayflower even though everyone in my town there were maybe out of the the many out of the large population in in my town growing up there were almost no anglers almost no uh very no no what about Leif Erikson I remember him being big among Scandinavian Americans in the 70s yeah yes uh certainly there's there was kind of a resurgence at some point um and you're kind of given different narratives depending on which family or which which group you're in. But certainly, I I remember as a kid, sort of thinking of myself as as an Anglo, uh, even though I don't have a drop of Anglo blood. And then, kind of as I got older, I was thinking about it, thinking, oh wait a minute, my whole perspective of of my own history and family history is is totally divergent from that. Yeah, That's I, it. I don't. I don't think I ever I, thought I, of myself as an Anglo in, in that sense, as opposed to being Germanic. Yeah, well, and as a small child, too, you just sort of believe, you're just sort of going with whatever your teachers say. I mean, our, you know, that's that's an interesting case of, like, you know, you're treating, you're su- supplanting another mythos based on your blood, which is, like, what's happening also all over America as we speak, like, with the or 1690 project and all that stuff you know it, it happens naturally you know you the scandinavians will just reassert the sagas and that stuff there's a mythos and the anglos will just go back to their own and you will you will eventually be drawn back to the real stuff of your ancestors i mean for example even there's even a deviation like a slight deviation between the norwegian mythos and the icelandic mythos Think about that. Even though we are yeah. practically the same same group, there are a few well, discrepancies, you know. Although you do see with Icelanders, kind of as a perfect case study of how uh, a colony or a diaspora group can serve as this time capsule in preservation for older, in your case, language um, and yeah, literature yeah. as well. Yeah, well, but an island is isolated, so I mean they're. Pretty far right. away from the rest of Denmark. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wanted to also mention, um, since we're talking about Germans, are you are you familiar with uh, the Hanseatic League? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, there's an interesting interaction between them and Iceland. Uh, it is be- beginning in the in the thirteenth in the thirteenth century. Uh, where they started to trade with Icelanders in, I think it lasted from from about 1432 or something, all the way up to the 16th century, when when they just completely dominated all trade routes to Iceland, and they also started fishing here. They, they started to fish on the coast because Iceland were, were mostly agrarian society. We were not. We were not uh, fishing that much in in the ocean. We didn't have, you know, sophisticated boats anymore. No, no timber basically, for, for one. So, but they 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 were. This was a period in Iceland known as the German Age. Mm-hmm. And and uh, it lasted up until, you know, it it. You, what preceded the German age was the English age, where, where, they, where it was like a trade between England and Iceland. Then the, the Hans, Hanseatic League took over, basically. They dominated all of the trade, and they built the first Protestant church, I think, in the in some in the 1500s in, in Hafnafjörður. Their, their base was Hafnafjörður. So... Which is just like um, that is really interesting. And and what was happening is that they they were hiring Icelanders to, you know, in the fishing boats. And because of that, uh, the 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 landowners, the wealthy landowners, they 
they lost most of the workforce because they uh, were getting paid they were getting paid more the the, the Hanseatic League were paying the workers more so you had to see actually you you, you saw these the beginnings of new settlements forming all over the country like a, if that this had continued you might have seen like more large towns than just Reykjavik across Iceland so what 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 they did is that they appealed to the Danish king in, I think in um, after the, in, in the in the 16, 1602 or something the Danish and the English the Danish king appealed to the English king and they decided to put a stop to this, you know, and, and they, uh, they, because Denmark owned Iceland, and they, the English helped the Danes enforce the, and they, and they told the Hanseatic League, you cannot, you can't do business with the Icelanders, but you, you cannot hire Icelanders to, on your boats, and you have to pay like a special tax or something, and that basically put an end to this era, uh, because it was like, a, you can see like a willful, you know, a willful yeah, action. You have action to work to... on a farm for less money when they can work for more money on the ship. Yeah, you see, you see this willful, you know, maintenance of the agrarian society. You know, they, they didn't want any cities forming here, like like willfully so, hmm. which is really interesting. You know, we, we there were no cities here, and they didn't want any municipalities. So. That's 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 very very interesting. Yeah, so. Well, and then as kind of a final question, then um, I'm I'm kind of out of out of stuff to ask. But as kind of a final question, do you auto think that the term German itself is perhaps too broad to be useful on an ethnographic level? Do you think? And this is just something that's popped into my mind throughout the stream. Should do you think it would maybe make more sense linguistically to, let's say, you have Germanic as the umbrella term, and then underneath that you have, you know, you have the Danes, you have, um, I don't even know exactly how you divide it, but perhaps dividing German as an ethnic category into say um well the mennonites i don't know if you necessarily call them their own well ethnos, they're, but they're pretty close to being an ethno-confessional group but a lot of the mennonites are originally of dutch descent they become germanized okay. as they move east yeah uh, so is this i mean is this a, uh an issue of the the national category of german perhaps being a bit too broad yeah, well, I mean, as they say, uh, a, uh, a language is a dialect with an army behind it. So if you have a, an organized state, you know, it, 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 it defines things for you in a way. So once, once you have Germany unified in 1871, uh, it becomes much clearer what, what a German is and what, is, what isn't, simply because the now a, a unified government in Berlin as opposed to having you know, a Prussian government and a, and a, a, a Saxon government and a, a Württemberg government and a Bavarian government, etc. Uh, but I, you know, the, the, both the czars and the Soviets defined German as uh, somebody whose ancestors came from Central Europe, who speaks a, a dialect of German, which included uh, things like uh, Plattdeutsch, which was very close to Dutch, uh, Alsatian, which uh, has some French influence, uh, even uh, uh, Schweizerdeutsch, which is uh, you know the weird weird dialect the Swiss speak, uh, and then was a member of a Christian denomination that was not Orthodox, so either mm. Catholic or Protestant. Uh, okay. Can I can I comment on this for? for a Shortly, if I if I may. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I I think I think my, my take on like, you know, German Germanic is a clear identity because it has a clear origins from the battle axe culture. Uh, you know, from circa like two 
2300 BC in southern Scandinavia. It, I think the Germanic battle axe culture originated from that area and spread into the central mainland. So uh, this is a clear ethnogenesis of the whole group and the genetics. Yeah. And, and so, so there's a clear lineage there of, of the Germanic peoples. And the Romans also make distinctions between, you know, they knew the difference between Celts and Germans and other barbarians. So they started out as a... We were all barbarians, but different barbarians. Yeah, but the yeah. Germans. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but all Germans were like, they were the same people all over, like everywhere, like basically... I, identical all over looked looked the same like there were some minor okay. ma minor okay. variation between okay. tribes and obviously but th th this is like th this is the identity you know a battler culture it, it consists of like various uh, material you know uh, okay. i think the the origins of the certain elements of material culture you know is, is i can't actually pinpoint what it is but well and but, and shared you know the same it is cer it's a gods. certain yeah it's a certain bio spirit if you would argue like a bio spirit it's a yeah i mean that's what fichte yeah. and herder were writing about yeah um, i mean yeah. i mean you know bavarians and but you still have these like many ethnic ethnicities in germany itself like bavarians and you know the the Prussians and the Saxons. Yeah, Saxons, and they are different. They are as different from each other than you know, Bavarians and like Northern Englanders are probably more similar than than Prussians and Bavarians. Like how they behave and how they, except for the language, obviously. But I would argue at least Prussians are like they have a bit of a different attitude. I think. Yeah, I think when we talk about any uh, broad European uh, ethnos, uh, they're certainly more put together in terms of, of cohesion uh, on all levels than, than, than we as white Americans are. So, I mean, you know, you can say that yeah, maybe, German maybe we're is not a big, to talk, broad, right? a broad term or Slav is a broad term, but there's a lot more similarities than you know what we've got because at this point we're just uh they said we're a racial category without any content <laughs> yeah and in, in, essentially in an economic zone rather than you know in a class in a nation in the classical sense of the term which right. is kind of where we where we find a lot of our tensions and problems and so forth but i think we were on our way to becoming an actual ethnos at one yeah. time and then we I got mean, do, waylaid. Do you, do you see a lot of parallels between, you know, white Americans, Americans of European descent in America and um, various different European ethnos, ethnoses, ethne, I'm not sure what the plural of ethnos is, um, in, in the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union had non-European, you know, they had Mongols and... and so forth they have quite a few yeah um yeah. The central asians and the i mean yeah. and i guess just to rephrase that do you see a lot of parallels between the sort of american empire and its ethnic situation and the soviet empire? no because i mean the soviets had everybody had their own little territory even diaspora groups uh got a little bit usually just a district but the the germans got the Volga german assr but uh, so you have a Ukrainian Soviet Social Republic and an Uzbek Soviet Social Republic. The only thing we have really that's similar to that is with Native Americans who are like 1%. But the, the communist idea of the 1920s and 30s to create like a black republic in the American South, that, that doesn't even have uh, any kind of abstract supporters anymore, yet alone it was never developed. Whereas in the Soviet Union, you actually had all these uh, ethno states within the USSR. They're largely symbolic, but that symbolism meant a lot because they had borders and they they used the indigenous language and they had, you know, uh, 
education system and uh, media system that was and uh, uh, cultural system that was geared towards a Soviet version of that culture and that ethos uh, identity. Uh, as I said, the only thing that's remotely parallel is you know something like the the Navajo reservation, the, the Dinata, where you have you know 150,000 Navajos living on their own land with their own language and the community college using it and a newspaper and a radio using it. But uh, the, for most of the population of the United States who are descended of migrants, either voluntary or in the case of uh, you know, uh, most black Americans, involuntary, there's no territorial uh, administration. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's gives a lot to chew on there um yeah for at least for me that's kind of all all i had to ask so hey i want to uh, unless you guys have something you want to kind of add at the end but um yeah i just want to give a huge thank you to Otto for taking the time to do this um i i know i'm not a huge channel so i don't have a ton to contribute but i do want all of you watching to please be sure to go check out his channel uh check out his books uh, do you want to do you want to talk a little bit about your books? Yeah, uh, this is my fourth book, uh, and it's actually the second one I've done is just on Russian Germans. But this is uh, published out of Germany, but it's in English. Uh, Ibn Press, uh, the distributor for the United States and Canada is Columbia University Press. It's uh, forty-two U.S. dollars, which is for an academic book, uh, a very good price. Uh, that's why it's. In I'll paperback, say. not I've uh, just graduated. Yeah, I'll say that. Yeah. But uh, it, it's uh, if you are in Europe and not North America, you can order it directly from the publisher in Stuttgart, Ibidem Press. All right. Uh, if you're in Great Britain, I'm not exactly sure what you do because they're neither in the European Union or North America. <laughs> but uh, uh, Certainly, you can publish it directly uh, if you're in the EU or the Columbia University Press if you're in the U.S. or Canada. Fantastic. Well, yeah, thanks again so much for your time. Hey, uh, maybe one of these days we'll be able to do another stream together. Uh, and Fiona, sure. thank you again for co-hosting. So, yeah, with that, oh, thank you, Obadiah. I just want to shout out the boys in chat. We got Obadiah. We got... Teutonic Warrior, we got Vingle, we got Crusader 21, got Michael Dishman. Uh, do we have that? We've got Jay Dallasan. All right. Well, for that, this has been another deep dive episode. So thanks for watching, everyone. All right. Thanks for having me on.